Well, I'm joined now by N.T. Wright, the former Bishop of Durham and a noted historian and Bible scholar. And he's joining me, um, well, very kindly from your holiday house in in the distant parts of Scotland, Tom. Um, so thank you very much for for making time to to chat with me today. And uh, but obviously thank we're you. all sort of getting used to this news that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died. Um, tell us a little bit about your recollections, Tom. Did you ever have opportunity to meet the Queen, um, especially, I suppose, in, in your role uh, as the Bishop of Durham? Yes, I did. Um, and before that as well, I was a canon of Westminster for three years before I went to Durham. And there were various great and state occasions then, for instance, the funeral of Princess Margaret, and then the funeral of the Queen Mother. And on both occasions, I was among those who were um, helping with the service, and we met the Queen beforehand, and so on. The time I spent most uh, time close with Her Late Majesty was when I was preaching for her at Sandringham, which is where the, uh, the Queen and the Duke would spend their Christmas holidays, and they would invite through January and early February, they would invite various bishops to come and stay for the weekend and preach on the Sunday. So one would turn up on the Saturday afternoon and then have sort of 36 hours, two nights, one would stay there. And uh, that was that was delightful. And it, the, the Queen and the Duke both made it so natural and easy to be en famille with them that it was, I had to pinch myself to remind myself, this is actually the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh I'm with, because um, actually they were a very similar age, slightly younger to my own parents. And the sort of things that they would be doing of a Saturday afternoon, whether watching the news on the television or playing the card game or something, would be really very similar to what I'd be used to yes. um, uh, in, in my own home. So it, it was it was really rather strange. And then, of course, there were various formalities about how things were done. Um, but the Queen herself was very relaxed and very together. And whether it was welcoming another guest and there were other house guests as well, or whether it was conversation over dinner, or whether it was um, taking the corgis out for their last um, uh, late night outing before bed, um, there she would be walking along the, the back corridor um, and, and saying goodnight to people and so on. And just very natural and very relaxed. And after the service on the Sunday, um, we had a delightful and rather quirky conversation because um, I had been asked to preach that weekend and I had checked what the readings were to be for the weekend. And so I had prepared a sermon on the official readings and the person who stood up to read the second lesson read the wrong lesson. Um, and it was actually a completely irrelevant bit of Mark's gospel. It should have been Mark 1, 3 to 11, and the person read Mark 4, 3 to 11, which bursts in in the middle of the parable of the sower and doesn't make any And the thing is, nobody seemed to notice except me as the preacher. <laughs> and I had to, um, I, I simply went uh, into the pulpit and said, this is the Sunday when the church thinks about John the Baptist, which is the, what I prepared to talk about. Um, but I, I explained to Her Majesty afterwards, and she was really quite intrigued by by this little glitch which had happened and, and which nobody nobody else had noticed. Um, but she was she was very friendly and uh, and clearly um, a very a very devout old fashioned Church of England Christian. And and I I have a, a strong memory from earlier when I was in Westminster and she was presiding at the opening of General Synod one year. And there was a great communion service in Westminster Abbey. And uh, she expressed great surprise afterwards because the way communion was distributed was by people simply walking forward in a line and receiving communion and then without kneeling down or anything, just carrying on and walking back. Whereas she and the Duke received communion first and they knelt down in their, uh, in their official seats. And it was obviously a surprise to her that now it was quite common for people to receive communion without kneeling down. And I had a, had a vision of, of this is who she was. She was somebody who worshipped. She was somebody whose, whose whole way of being a Christian was that sort of what we now would think of as an old-fashioned Anglican way, where actually kneeling was really quite important and, uh, uh, and worshipping was, was something one did with one's whole body. So um, I have nothing but respect for her, um, quite apart from the extraordinary service. I mean, to say when you're 25, I'm going to dedicate myself 
to you, my people, um, and then <laughs> to spend the next 70 years doing it. Um, th that's, that's an extraordinary example, which I think um, very few countries in the world have ever had. Um, and certainly we in our national history, we've had a very checkered career with monarchs coming and going, and she has actually played a blinder. And I, I, that's mm. obviously not controversial. Everyone, mm. I think, would say the same. So much, much to be grateful for, to her, to God, um, to, to one another for being part of this whole um, uh, yes. extraordinary country that we have learned to live in and almost taken for granted. But at a time like this, it's clear we can't take it for granted. We have to mm. say prayers, both of gratitude for her and for her successor, because he's yeah. got a very, very difficult act to follow. Indeed, indeed. I mean, you were probably too young to remember the coronation it's, itself, Tom. Um, uh, I, I don't, But it, I do get the sense that she really did regard that as the taking on of a sacred vocation that this wasn't oh, yes. just another ceremony she 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 as a christian and i i think her christian faith has only shone the brighter you know in her late in her later years but that she really did regard this as a as a sacred duty that she had been given in that sense yes that's absolutely right Right. I do remember the coronation because I remember as a small boy being taken um, to the town square. We lived in the far north of England and uh, th there was some sort of ceremony and a town crier or whatever. And my sister and I were both given um, coronation Bibles, um, a little chunky King James version. And I think we had coronation socks and I think we had a coronation mug <laughs> and so on. So th those are things which were designed to stick the event in one's mind. And they did stick the event in one's mind. But I don't remember anything of the former king. And of course, we didn't have a television in those days. So we didn't watch the coronation on television. Um, one of my aunts uh, went to London and queued for hours and hours in the rain. So she was actually there and came home to tell us about it. But <laughs> it, it wasn't something something that impinged in the way it would now. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so so throughout my life, she's just been the constant. And there's so many people mm. who, who are in that same position. But that sense of vocation that she had, that this was a God-given sort of um, aspect to her yes. life, that, that seems to have been something that, that has shone through in her life, would you say? Yes, absolutely right. And I remember reading that Archbishop Geoffrey Fisher um, um, made up specially for her a book of prayers, a little book of prayers, private prayers, for her to say in the weeks coming up to the, um, uh, to the coronation, so that she was preparing herself uh, for this in the way that uh, clergy might prepare for ordination. And indeed, she clearly saw it as a sort of ordination with the anointing and so on. Um, and I remember people have stressed that she saw this as a very sacred moment, so that the television cameras, which were watching the rest of the ceremony, were actually not allowed to see that moment. It was kind of such an intimate mm. um, moment of her praying for the equipment of God's Holy Spirit through the anointing. Um, to be the sort of person that, that, you know, Isaiah 11 talks about, where the anointing with the Spirit equips the monarch to be somebody who will be a reconciler, a peacemaker, um, and, and all, of those, all of those things, which the Old Testament emphasizes are the proper characteristics of a monarch. <clears throat> and it's wonderful to think that she was prayerfully embracing that as a vocation. Um, as I say, much as many, many clergy have seen their ordination as commissioning them for a whole lifetime. It's not just a job. This is who you now are, um, not just a role you slip in and out of. And as I say, she clearly saw that single-mindedly and went for it throughout the rest of her very long life. Mm. She she obviously had that role of defender of the faith, you know, the yes. in a sense, the, the governor of the Church of England, it, whatever that actually <laughs> meant in practice, obviously, in terms of her actual ability to to influence matters in the Church of England, uh, I suppose is debatable. But but nevertheless, she 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 was because of her own Christian faith. She 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 did seem to steer and, and to, to give a sense of permanence and direction, I, I suppose. We are going to miss that because um, there's there's a sense in which as she passes on, there's there's a sense in which I suppose we we, we naturally ask questions about you know is this the end of some particular era of Christendom uh, as the Queen passes on? What where does that leave us? I don't know if you've any thoughts on that. Well, <clears throat> I 
think we've been extraordinarily lucky in the Church of England to have a monarch who is the titular head of the church, which is, of course, a historical accident going back to Henry VIII. Um, nobody before then saw things quite like that. But mm -hmm. granted, she has inhabited that role. She's inhabited it extraordinarily effectively at a time in our culture when people more than ever before are looking out for sincerity or its opposite, insincerity. Mm -hmm. And when one thinks of some of the people who have been notionally defender of the faith before, some of the kings um, uh, the, over the last three or 400 years, um, one shudders at the thought of them being hailed as defender of the faith or head of the church or whatever. But she has seen, no, if that's the role, then I'm going to play it straight mm. down the line. And she's done that. Um, and as I say, at a time when people are very inclined to sneer and poke at any uh, um, inconsistencies in public mm. behavior or private behavior of people in public life and so on, she has set an example, an extraordinary example of how to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's not easy, obviously, for anyone to follow that. And and we can't look into the the private um, uh, thoughts of her successor. But um, he is himself a man of faith. I don't know him personally. I've only met him very fleetingly once or twice. Um, but I'm sure he will see his mother's example as something um, remarkable to live up to. And I think he'll give it his best shot. Mm. And I suppose for those who are sort of coming to terms with the end of a very significant reign, the end of something that in a sense granted a sense of permanence and stability in many ways to British culture and indeed globally. Um, how, how do we move forward? Um, what, what, what are the prayers that you will be praying and encouraging others to pray as, as we kind of move into a, a new era without Queen Elizabeth at, at the forefront of things? Well, um, from the very beginning, the church has always encouraged one another to pray for monarchs and all who are in positions of responsibility and authority. That's in uh, in one of the pastoral letters Paul urges, because whatever regime you're living under, it is appropriate to pray for them, because, and we must never forget this, um, in Judaism and in early Christianity at least, um, there is a strong sense of of the goodness of God's creation, which includes God's intention that his world be ruled wisely by wise human beings. And that is something one can pray for, whatever the faith or lack thereof that the particular human beings may have. You know, we've had great leaders of the past. I think of Winston Churchill, who saw himself as uh, like a buttress supporting the church from the outside rather than the inside, um, and probably himself being some kind of a deist rather than a Trinitarian Christian. But one could still, and people did, pray for him for wisdom in his hour of great extraordinary responsibility. So uh, there, there is. I, th I think we're not very used to thinking this one through in. Uh, the Western world, particularly within modern democracies, um, where prime ministers or presidents come and go and, and so on. But that is a primary task of all Christian people to pray for the rulers of the, the nations of the world and local government as well, wherever they may be, and whatever the actual beliefs of the people for whom they are thus praying. Um, because again and again in the Bible, of course, uh, God's sovereignty over all people is demonstrated even though it doesn't always work out the way we might like. So when you actually have had somebody who is um, explicitly and, and um, quite genuinely uh, signed up for the full Christian faith, and she, was, she made no secret of that, obviously, in her Christmas broadcasts, we look back times when she was very clear about her allegiance to Jesus and her desire that the peace and uh, and harmony which Jesus came to bring should become a reality in her people and throughout the world. You know, when we look back on that, we say, yes, would that all uh, rulers, all monarchs were, were thus minded. Um, of course, when you have a constitutional monarchy and then a parliamentary democracy sitting, as it were, underneath it, that is a particular balance which we have maintained now for many years. It seems more or less to work. It isn't the only way to do wise government. 
but there's all sorts of reasons to suppose that it's it's a a, a way which seems to suit our rather strange um, unwritten constitution and so on. So we should all be praying for wisdom, not only for um, King Charles, as he now is, but for all those who advise him and for those who serve under him, all the way down through Parliament to the, the, the local governments under which we all live. In, in a moment, I will ask you to pray to that effect, Tom. But just, just one last question, I suppose. Um, as as many people now sort of suddenly come to terms with with this, there, there'll, there'll be a lot of opportunity for churches to be opening their doors, cathedrals and so on, to give space for people to reflect, um, to, to pay their respects, condolences. I'm sure there will be uh, the funeral itself will be an important occasion for that as well. In a sense, that the church, especially the institutional church, the Church of England, comes into its own very often in these important moments of national mourning and uh, and these moments. So, what what what's your hope um, as as we try to make sense of this for people? And often they bump up against a sense of eternity and the sacred and that sort of thing in these moments. What 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 can the church be doing? What can we be doing to to encourage individuals as they process this themselves? Yes, I think um, there's the wider picture that uh, the church should always be reminding people of the overall sovereignty of God, the creator, who wants his world to be wisely ordered. And so as we give thanks for the wise ordering of our society through some turbulent times over the last 70 years, we pray that uh, similarly, with whatever transition is now appropriate, we will be able to go forward with that same spirit and that same sense of national coherence under under wise and faithful leadership. And we will pray for Charles particularly and for his advisors that that may be so. Um, but secondly, uh, I remember many of Christmas broadcasts where she was very explicit about Christmas being a time of celebrating Jesus and Jesus being the one that she has done her best to follow and believe in and serve throughout her life. And I think it would be a lovely thing if churches could find ways of collecting the clips of those broadcasts where she said that kind of thing and using those as a way of um, actually preaching the gospel and saying, this is who Jesus was and is and will be, and this is what it looks like to sign on to follow him with your whole life. I think then her legacy could be an extraordinary ongoing one of a challenge to personal faith and allegiance. Mm -hmm. Finally, Tom, thank you for the time you've given us. Perhaps you could just pray for, for the Queen, for the family, for the country uh, at, at this moment. Father, we thank you for Queen Elizabeth II. We thank you for her life, her dedication, her example, her following Jesus faithfully through to the end. We pray now that she may rest in peace and rise in glory in the final new creation which you have promised. We pray for Charles and all those who advise him and for the whole royal family, that throughout this time of mourning they may know your presence, your love and your peace. And for our country, as we move through this extraordinary transition, that we may find faithful ways forward into a new day of more fidelity, more devotion, and more service to one another and to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tom. Thanks, Justin. Good to see you as always.